إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس أبى واستكبر وكان من الكافرين وقال عز وجل بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس والضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء Today's topic is actually very important. It is the subject of self-discovery in Islam. Just say, "Bal nikay khudi, khudi ka dufan khala." Okay, this concept is that we bal ne diya ke apne man ke dub ke baaja saraj se zindagi. How does one find? spiritual life by falling deep within themselves? This is the question. So, today I will be talking about Today I will be talking about Iqbal's concept of Khudi and the Islamic process of self-discovery, how self-discovery happens. So for that, I actually wrote an article today for our website, uh, bookofscience.org uh, at Furqan Foundation. While I was writing that, I decided that I want to talk about this subject. But in this paper, I've only mentioned one dimension. There are actually two dimensions to uh, finding the uh, self. Finding the self, there are two dimensions. So I'm going to read my article. <coughs> And then I'm going to read a few more things. And this is an extremely, extremely important topic. It is such a wonderful topic, as it will be uh, discussed in Shalantara. The title of the article that I wrote is Melancholy, meaning sadness. Sadness in the great prophets. You see, because in Islam, on the one side you have depression. On the one side you have depression. On the other side, you have anxiety. So basically, psychologists and psychiatrists divide most of everything into two categories. Either it's leading to depression or it's leading to some sort of anxiety. La khawfun alayhim wa la kum yahzanun. Khawf is the anxiety and uh, huzn is the depression. But there is a certain type of sadness that's positive. And this is something we live in a world that wants everything to be happy. Even religion is propagated as religion is the cure to sadness. And this is not true from an Islamic point of view because there are 200 ayat in the Quran regarding the sadness of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ went through, you can say, spells of deep sadness. It was not depression, but it was still sadness. And so this this idea of, of depression needs to be understood. So, regarding that, I wrote this small 500 word article uh, for the website. So I'm gonna read that first. And then we're gonna discuss some of the other aspects uh, regarding this. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, and Jesus were known to be men of melancholy, meaning sadness. Jesus in the Bible is, depict, is, de is depicted as a man of sorrows. European paintings of Jesus, such and such and such, show him in a sad state. Quran states in regards to the Prophet ﷺ, his sadness, Perhaps, O Prophet, you will kill yourself over them with grief that they do not believe. And then there are many other. 
even when he was in the cave, when the Prophet was in the cave for 40 days, he was in a state of sadness for the most part. أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكْ وَعَدَعْنَا أَنْكَ وِذْرَكْ أَلَّذِي أَنْكَ ذَحْرَكْ So in the same way, يَا يُحَلْ مُزَمِّلْ is symbolic of a person who is relatively in a sad state. And there are certain things, we live in a society, whether it is through self-help books, whether it is through pills or 10-step programs, we try to get rid of sadness. And this is a very big problem because of the benefits, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put, a, put a, a procedure, a natural procedure, like there's day and then there's night. You can't get rid of the night. Trying to get rid of the night as if it, and trying to pretend or trying to make the earth stop only facing the daytime is not something that uh, is going to work. <coughs> so, the Prophet said, نزل القرآن بالحزن فقرعوا بالحزن The Quran was revealed in sadness. So read it in sadness. Popular religious leaders, however, such as Billy Graham. Billy Graham is the big, you can say, mufti of America. Describe Jesus as a divine therapist who can quickly eliminate depression and other troublesome emotions. Graham even encourages people to pray to remove their sadness which he maintains as a result of sin. Of course, this is true in some cases, but this is not absolutely true, because the Prophet went through great, deep states of sadness. The real thing is, if you can come out of that sadness naturally, right? And how you go into sadness and then come out of it, this is the real issue that needs to be understood. And we will study that great thinkers like Iqbal, Muslim, non-Muslim, great thinkers always went through spells of depression. Okay, so This is one of the qualities also Dr. Isra Ahmed had. He would talk about his state of sadness and depression many, many times. And this is because great people are very sensitive to the world outside them. And, and so, he, so, however, science has confirmed the link between geniusness and depression. As Henry Frederick said, melancholy, meaning sadness, is at the bottom of everything. When sadness is, it's like the darkest area. So you can only, you can, you can, when you are hitting the bottom of everything, then you got, you got, you only can go upwards, right? So you experience yourself fully. So artificially keeping yourself from hitting the bottom, so to say, is not going to help. Sadness is at the bottom of everything, just as the end of all rivers lead to the sea. Why is sadness so important to a balanced mental health? Psychologist Carl Jung researched this principle after reading the Taoist treatise, The Secret of the Golden Flower. Through his studies, he came to believe that two things that appear to be opposites are, in re are really interdependent manifestations of the same principle. For example, day and night. They seem to be opposites, but they're, they're, they're part of the same system. Right? So things that are usually opposite are actually interdependent. There's some underlining point that, in, that not only by which they're opposites, but some underlining reasoning that how they are interrelated. So we, in that way, we get to now understand happiness, in faraha, and sadness, how they are entered, what is the underlining psychological principle that makes them come together? Because it's this part of the same system. <clears throat> he came to believe two things that appear to be opposite are often really interdependent manifestations of the same principle. Jung learned from his research that sadness leads to understanding. Without sadness, there is no shaping of identity. He concluded that sadness is essential to mental health. It promotes people to turn away from the superficiality and to look deeper into the real meaning of things. Meaning, if you look at the Qur'an and look at the stories of the Prophets, whether it is Yunus والسلام, and the fish, La ilaha illa anta subhana la inni kuntu min al or whether it is Ayyub والسلام, inni masani al wa anta rahman rahimin, most of the Prophets, you will see them speaking to their people, 
addressing their people, whether it is Musa or Nuh or Ibrahim or whoever, right? Uh, you will see them speaking to their people in a state of sadness. And that represents a state of great somberness, rationality, to be very somber, to be very depression, not depression, but sadness connects people with reality. When you hit bottom, as they say, when you hit bottom, when you lose your million dollars or some boat is about to sink, as the Quran mentions, reality hits at that time. When somebody's in the hospital, like Yusuf Islam was, and you hit bottom, when you hit, sadness hits you, it puts you in touch with reality. And so the Prophet's ability or the Prophet's connectedness to reality, as he used to pray, Allahumma arin al haqqa kama here, oh Allah, show us the truth as it is, meant that he was not just in a jolly jolly entertainment state. And this needs to be embraced because we have so much embraced so much of entertainment. And we've embraced so much of being jolly and entertained and sensation that it has thrown us off to reality, to a state of, 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 of hyper ghafla, you can say, a state of, you could say, exuberant ghafla from reality. And this is, this is the fact with our kids, and this is the fact with many of us that we stay. And so, why? Okay, so we're coming to this point. <coughs> It promotes people to turn away from superficiality and to look deeper into the meaning of things. A sad mood keeps the mind questing, questioning and leading to introspection. In an increased shallow world, it helps people stay in touch with reality. If you like the truth, then you don't want anything to do with the truth. See, on the ones, and this is the state of the world, it's like such a when the world is headed for all these disasters, right, on the one side, and then on the other side, you have hyper-entertainment, to that people are not even aware of where the world is going. And the person who is mildly sad, or in a melancholic state, he's in touch with these trends, realities of things. And so, a person like Iqbal who talks about Khudi, who himself used to be in a state of sadness, it's very important that if you want to become a genius, if you want to really impact history, and I'll talk about the, the link between depression and geniuses in, in a second, but the point I'm trying to make here is that we should not, you know, this idea of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and as if Lack of happiness is a mental disease. This is how it's looked at in, in today's world. Oh, you know, if you're not happy, you somehow have a mental disease. No, this is... See, the, a person, when he goes into reality, it's like he goes into darkness. Then the mercy of Allah, the rahmah of Allah, pulls him back towards light. Okay, which we can call happiness. That, but it's the rahmah of Allah. If there is Allah and the mercy of Allah, He knows is there then the mercy of Allah will take him out of that darkness into light. Then reality will hit him again. And he will go back into the state of depression. This phenomenon, this process, is the process of self-discovery that the companions and the Prophet went through. So, people nowadays do not accept their sad moods, nor view them as beneficial. They seek to do away with it for good. It's become a sort of religion in itself to seek pills or talk to a therapist or talk to a religious leader who will then somehow get you out of And the guru who help people get rid of their sad states are treated as priests and priestesses. People's aversion to sadness and pain stems from their fear of dying. This is the, we don't like to be sad because sadness happens. If you look throughout the Qur'an, while there is duality in the universe, there is, you know, the light and the dark, and there's this duality, but this duality is predictable. It's a predictable duality. 
there's happiness, then there'll be sadness. Right? With every ease, there's hardship. With hardship, there's ease. <coughs> so this predictable duality, when you are in it, now what happens? When you're happy, you feel in control. You feel things are in status quo. Things are not going to change. And when you're sad, you're sad because you have experienced a change of some sort. Something has changed. And so the world is not in your control. <coughs> and so when you're sad, something is out of your control and you're sad. Which ultimately is connected with our fear of... And Carl Jung was one of the main people who said, you know how Freud said everything is about sex? And Edler said everything is about power. Carl Jung said everything is about dying. And he is essentially Quranically correct. Everything is about resolving the, the state of change from life to dead, from, from happiness to sadness. It is ultimately about there is a changing world and you're living in a world that's always flowing and changing. This is how Allah made it. Always change. And every <coughs> moment he's in a new state of glory, everything is changing all the time. And we want stability. And when we experience the lack of that, that stability, we are faced with dying in a sense. And every time there is such a situation, it's almost like we're facing our death. So, he said, so people, aversion to sadness and pain stems from the fear of dying. Connecting your sadness state involves recognizing that everything and everyone is temporary. When you're sad, you realize things, you lose money or you lose job or you lose your friends or you lose your family. The state of sadness helps you connect to reality and not only it helps you connect with reality, but it helps you connect with the reality that everything is temporary. Because sadness happens when the state of affairs. So, you know, Yunus was fine and then he's in the fish. Or Ayub was fine and then now he has a disease. So the state of so it's a changing world and it's not in our control and everything is temporary. And that's what a person who is sad realizes. A person who is happy, always happy, always entertained. He wants to just put himself on pause in that state of entertainment and pause. But there's no such thing. There's no, that's not a reality. That's a pseudo-reality. And so, <clears throat> so, connecting your melancholy state involves recognizing that everything and everyone is temporary. There is no question that clinical depression is real and that it is... That, the for, for the severely depressed, and what I mean by here is somebody who, can, who has no sense of hope. Somebody who has no sense of hope. And this is what the word Iblis means. And when we study the story of Adam from this perspective, you'll see it comes, there are two processes of self-discovery that are innately mentioned in the Quran. This is one of them. The other we will discuss when we study the story of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. There's no question that clinical depression is real and that the severely depressed are those people who have a sense of worthlessness. They, they have no hope. That is a different. The Prophet always had, knew the mercy of Allah is there. Right? So this is the difference. And so the severely depressed, such treatment is necessary. Melancholy is the telescope to truth. Instead of trying to lead a life of total happiness, the Prophet taught us to lead a life of predictable opposites. After every hardship, there's ease. With happiness comes sadness, with life comes death. The life is a flow between these opposites. Any attempt to stop this flow is in fact connected to the fear of death. Right? Even al the one who counts his money over and over again, trying to keep things status quo, right, is the attempt to stay away from death. Any attempt to stop this flow is in fact connected to the fear of death. To be happy is to feel you're living and in control, and sadness is losing control. The Prophet of Islam encouraged people to be in a state of sadness. 
He said, you would cry more and laugh less if you knew the reality. He taught crying, he taught to cry while reading Quran. He taught to cry and praying to Allah. He many times went into spells of sadness. Just as there is night and day, light and darkness, our sad mood can throw us into reality about ourselves and our world. Every prophet of God is depicted in the Quran in some state of melancholy, I means some state of sadness. So embrace your sadness. This is the article that I wrote. But now what I want to do is go to the next part of this. Actually, before I go here, I want to go over here. So now, so the one aspect of self-discovery is to one is, of course, if someone is suffering, there's benefits to suffering. You'll have some reward in the hereafter. I'm not talking only about that. I'm talking about seeing sadness as a way of getting in touch with reality. It is a necessary element in shaping your own internal identity and how you see reality in front of you. It is a necessary fact of life. Now, the second is... The process of self-discovery as described in the Surah Al-Baqarah and other places in the Qur'an regarding the story of Adam and Iblis. So we will just start from ayah number 34 where it says, بَعْضَ عَوْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ Now what's interesting is Allah says, to all the angels bow down to Adam. So they all bow except for Iblis. Now put this in a dramatic scene. If you're standing and everyone has bowed down and you're the only one who's not bowing down, it's a pretty dramatic scene. Right? So here is Iblis. <coughs> he sees every, the whole environment is encouraging him to bow down to Adam alayhi salatu and uh, except he doesn't bow down. And he becomes Iblis at, at this point. And Iblis in the Arabic word, in the Arabic language is from Ablasa Yablisu, which means losing all hope. Losing all hope. You see this natural process where you, you have sadness or you see something negative, but you have the mercy of Allah so you can come out of it. Shaytan was not able to see the mercy of Allah or even feel the mercy of Allah in any way. See, what happens is when everyone is bowing down, right? What happens? Now contrast this with Adam in a second. But there is an internal conflict that happens. Everyone is doing this, but I am not doing this. Right? Just keep this internal idea of internal conflict in mind. So Allah says, وَإِذْ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ أَبَى So he refused. وَاسْتَكْبَرَ And he became proud. Okay. So he wasn't... He was delusional, basically. And, and I'll come to this point. He refused. أَبَى means refusing completely. Even Allah said, why? What has stopped you? So on and so forth. But he refused. وَاسْتَكْبَرَ And he sought his greatness. So he became of those people that deny Allah or deny the reality or deny the truth or are ingrateful to Allah. And now contrast this. So we said, Oh Adam, you and your wife live in Jannah. And you eat from the fruits of Jannah as much as you like. And don't go near this tree. And you will be amongst the volume. Over there he didn't do it, he became kafir. But over here Allah says, you will become volume. Now, I, this is what I want to explain. So what does it mean? Now again, dramatically understand this in the dramatic scene. It means Adam and Hawa. See, if you read the riwayat of the hadith of the Prophet Adam became bored in Jannah. He actually became, you can say, sad. And, he, and so Allah, to make him happy, created his wife. 
This is why I say sometimes to the sisters when they say, oh, what do women get in Jannah? You know, you get this, everything in Quran is about the men. I said, no, men only need one thing. <laughs> the rest, the jewels and the silver and the gold, you can have them. I mean, for, you, you know, look at Adam Alayhi He was sad if he didn't have his companion. So, so Adam was sad and then he had his wife, but there's no sense of inner conflict. There's no world of conflict. They're eating as much, they're eating and they're happy and they're eating and they're happy. And then Shaitan, he's now kicked out, he seduces Adam and Hawa, and now they find themselves in the first internal conflict. They find themselves in the first internal conflict. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمْ أُسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِعْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِي الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُنَ مِنَ الْقَوَالِمِينَ He will be amongst the zulm. You will do injustice by doing this. Now two things are very important here. One is the rule. Don't go near this tree. And the other is Shaitan, how Shaitan helps Adam find his self-discovery. Because Adam is now inciting, uh, Iblis is now inciting Adam to do something wrong. Doing that thing wrong creates a sense of conflict. Doing that wrong thing, because now this is the first time human being is experiencing inner conflict. I mean, this is a very important, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but... Um, let me explain it to you this way. This is very, very psychologically significant. To, to have this inner conflict for the first time. And this is the first human experience of inner conflict. It's very, very significant. Um, I don't know if I have time, but let me explain it to you this way. You know the Jews and the Arabs, they were fighting each other in one more. The Jewish tribes and the Arab tribes were fighting each other. Now the Arab tribes, they were nomads, and they were simple people, and they had simple lifestyle. So what happened is when they had a very good understanding that if you're fighting with someone, you don't eat the food of the people you're fighting with. The Jewish community was losing, the Jewish tribes were losing the battle. So the Jewish people decided to give food to the Arab tribes. Because they were losing, so they said, we'll give them food. Now they're in this internal conflict, right? How can you eat the food of someone and fight with them? It wasn't something that they had experienced something, it was not something they'd experienced prior to that in their consciousness. So the idea that if they're going to give us food, we can't fight with them. And so that was the strategy that the Jewish tribes used to, to stop the war because they were going to lose. And so, and so in the same way, you know, the, 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 think of it like this internal thing is happening that has never happened before. So now, <coughs> what happens? Uh, so shaitan slipped them from where they were. And he took them out of the state that they were in. And we said, Allah said, you are now enemies of one another. Now notice this ihbitu minha is repeated twice. Ihbitu ba'dukum li ba'dan adu in one place. And then two ayahs later, ihbitu jami'an, all of you together. So in one place it says, all of you go down together. And in one place it says, all of you leave your enemies of one another. Opposite. Going together is one state of unity, right? And being enemies of one another is, you're opposed to one another. Just keep this in mind. فَأَزَلَّهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا So shaitan slipped them, made them slip. فَأَخْرَجَهُمْ مِمَّا كَانَ فِيهِ And they came out of the state they were in. وَقُلْ نِحْبِتُوا بَعْدُكُمْ لِبَعْدِ نَدُوا And we told them, leave, you are now enemies of one another. So they had this state of harmony, they had this state of tranquility, they never experienced any inner conflict, nor interpersonal conflict. And now this is their first time experiencing Internal conflict as well as external, interpersonal relationship conflicts. So now what happens? وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَدَاوٌ إِلَاهِينَ For the, in the earth you have istikrar, you have some stability to an appointed time. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ So now فَتَلَقَّى here, تَلَقِّي means to meet, but it, over here in this ayah it means to receive wahi. 
فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ So Adam got wahi from his Rabb. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ So that he can do tawbah to him. How did he resolve this inner conflict that he had? He resolved this inner conflict he had by being able to do tawbah, by turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُ وَالتَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Again, tawbah means that the rahmah of Allah is greater than your internal conflict. Right? Your Allah's rahmah is greater than your 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 sin, your dhul. Okay. In nahu wa tawab rahim, then Allah says, "Qul nihbitu minha jamia." So now all of you go down again. Why is repeated twice? I've not read any tafsir that has an answer to this, but I think the first time when Allah said it, your enemies of one another, maybe they were taken out of jannah, or. There was probably two phases in this. Allahu Akbar. قُلْ نِحْبِتُ مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا فَإِمَّا يَعْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا So when my guidance comes to you, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ So whoever follows this guidance, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ There's no خوف for him. خوف meaning fear. There's خَشِيَةٌ and خوف in Arabic. خوف, there's no خوف for him. وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they will have no sadness. Meaning there are two, two things here. He will have no anxiety. For the khawf, scholars have said the following two things. Number one, khawf is for the future. Sadness is for the past. So khawf is for the future, which means anxiety, anticipating something. And huzn is being depressed because of something in the past. And the other thing scholars have mentioned about لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون is khawf is for others. And huzn is for yourself. Fear for yourself, you're saying? And sadness for others. For other. Khawf is for yourself. Okay. When they were in Ghari Sawar, then the ayat of Qur'an Wala tahzan. For, for the Prophet, not for himself. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's what Shia people say, that he was <coughs> he was fearing himself. And the word Huzan is used. And Makkah just clarified that he was fearful for the Prophet. He was not fearful for himself. And the word used is Huzan for him. The ayah in the Quran, because the tafsirs that mention hope for others and wasn't for yourself, but over there it would be ourselves, meaning Abu Bakr saw himself and the Prophet as one, and even the Quran mentions them as one, right? Uh, in that, in that, huma uh, fi right? Uh, Right. وَلَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Allah is with us. So, uh, but there is another ayah in the Quran. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يُعِذُكُمُ الْفَقْرَ Shaytan causes you to fear poverty. So, that's for others. So, Allah Ma'ana. But again, this is not... Uh, I mean, remember, the Mufassirin are human beings too. Right. This is... Uh, Psychologically speaking, all the Sunder factors. Mm. And your Sunder is just a unity from the internal factors. Mm. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Also. That that is, I think it's interchangeable. Uh, like Rasul and Nabi in Quran can be interchangeable. Yeah, of course. So, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So, whoever follows the guidance, he'll have no khawf and he'll have no huzn. Now, huzn here is the yahzanun is the Yahzanin, Yahzanun, Yahzanin would be the state of sadness. Yahzanun is the people of sadness. They're just grumpy people. This is not what we're talking about. When we're talking about the Prophet's state, we're talking about somebody who would go into a state of depression and then come out because of the mercy of Allah. Iblis means he's, he has no hope. He went into the state of sadness and he couldn't come out. He couldn't see the mercy of Allah. You see? So, Allah says, so there were two things that are important here. For the state of conflict, first there was a rule, don't go near the tree. Without that, there would be no state of conflict. Right? If there was no rule, there would be no state of conflict. The rules that Islam gives, why people don't like them, especially in the modern age, because it creates inner conflict. And the world of today doesn't like to be in state of inner conflict. Right? I would rather not have state of conflict than to say, okay, I'm doing wrong, I'm sorry, I do tawbah. It's too hard, it's too real. 
It's too authentic. It's too authentic. It's too real. You have to dive into yourself and admit to yourself your human weaknesses. And we don't like to do that in the modern times. Everything has to be charming and, you know. And this is why people, even when we talk about hell, it's like, when we talk about hell, when we talk about hell, it's like, don't talk about hell. Because the reality of it, we don't want to accept the consequences of its reality. So anyway, so Allah says, when my guidance comes, then that same thing the angels were fearing, that He would cause bloodshed in the world. Allah says, no, they would create peace in the world. And, Now, this is very interesting. This is the, actually the main ayah over here, the main part. Kafaru here means what? Doesn't mean kufr, as in the sense of disbelief, no. Over here, kafaru means, because you have to look at the sayap, uh, the, 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 who did kufr? Iblis did kufr. His kufr was what? Being ingrateful to Allah. And being ingrateful to Allah leads a person, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا The one who denied the truth, because he was ingrateful. And uh, the, the one who is ingrateful, and وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا And then he, Denies our science. So being ingrateful leads to denying the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In it they will remain. And they will remain there. They're the people of the fire, they'll in it they will remain. Why is this important? Because notice what happened with Iblis. Iblis went into a state of depression, you can say. Allah has chosen someone else more than him. But because of his kufr, his ingratitude, because kufr has two opposites. The kufr's opposite is iman, and kufr's opposite is shukr. Kufr has two opposites. So, uh, in here it is being used as shukr, the opposite of shukr. وَالَّذِينَ kafaru, Because kafaru would include وَكَذَّبُ بِآيَاتِنَا so, so it doesn't mean that here. It means iblis. وَالَّذِينَ kafaru And the people like iblis. وَالَّذِينَ kafaru. وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا And then they are denying our signs. Why? Because they're ingrateful. They deny our signs. And so, if you're always going to put somebody in a state of happiness and you want to put them in status quo and they're always going to be in a state of happiness and they never want to be in a state of sadness, then what happens to that person when he, when he accidentally, or not accidentally, but per, uh, by, by his life, he falls into the state of the then he loses all hope because he didn't want that. He thought it's unnatural for that to happen. And he doesn't expect that it's something natural and he doesn't expect, uh, you know, that, uh, that if something like that happens, it's uh, something extremely terrible, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has and then, But the person like Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, who saw the mercy of Allah, so when he did wrong, he was able to turn to Allah and he saw فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ So he met, he got wahi from Allah so that he could do tawbah to Allah. So now that conflict that was inside, that was resolved. So when we're talking about Iqbal's concept of khudi, this process of uh, falling into an inner conflict Knowing that the mercy of Allah is there by which you can pull yourself out. But not being so much in the state of happiness that it's all mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy because you just want to give yourself that label. No. You have, you know, tawbah, the Prophet said, a tawbah tun nidana. Tawbah is feeling regret. Again, when you do some sin, it connects you back to reality. Because sin, the the zam, the 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 ifam, the sin is something that connects you back to your inner self. That inner conflict that you're having is because it's 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 making you realize your inner self, and for that matter, the darker part of your inner self, that part of yourself that pricks you when you do something wrong, and that part of yourself that you would dislike other people to know. You dislike that other people come to know about it. But, so, Tawbah is 
leads to a certain type of sadness. <coughs> or no, rather, Tawbah is the result of a certain type of sadness. Just like La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al mean That was like a type of Tawbah by uh, Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. But, but this inner reality that you reach, you reach because of your ability to dive within. Now, kufr, interestingly enough, even though the opposite of kufr is iman and shukr, but the word kufr means to cover. Right? Literally, it means to cover. So what is happening here? If you are covering yourself from hitting reality, you're covering yourself from being able to deal with the inner conflicts. You want to ignore the inner conflicts you have. You want to cover the inner conflicts you have. When a Prophet of Allah shows you, oh, here is a camel coming out of the stones, and it is six, you know, 10 feet tall, and it, uh, it is a miracle from Allah. What? You have an internal conflict. Should I believe? Should I not believe? You want to cover it. You want to cover the plain truth. And then that leads you to doing kufr. That's what is, that's the phenomenon that's happening. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and 15 minutes. 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, I will end here because the next part is uh, related to this, but let me see if I can get to that. And that is the link between uh, depression and, uh, and, and geni geni gen geniusness. So this is an abstract of a book called Against Happiness. The purpose of this book is the, the, the psychologists here are saying don't try to put everyone always in the state of happiness. Let them be sad. And he is writing this book and he's saying it's a great danger to the American society to try to keep them always happy. Because happiness leads to geniusness and creativity and so on and so forth. I'm just going to read some parts off. More than anything, Americans want to be happy. Okay. Used pills, positive psychology, self-help books, motivational lectures to eliminate sadness from the cultural landscape. And then, oh, attaining complete happiness even though it would be artificial. In fact, there's a book out there called Artificial Happiness, which talks about the pills people take and how many pills uh, people are taking nowadays. Attaining complete happiness would wipe out America's creative, inventive, philosophical, and imaginative impulses. Any society would lose its soul without a healthy dose of sadness. Sadness forces people to look beyond the appearances of things into the reality of things. Sadness, beauty, and death, death are interlinked with one another. And this is another subject that I'm not going to go into today, but it, it's true. And then he says, So what happens when someone is stay, set, sad? Sad people move through phases of doubt and sadness toward a deeper and fuller understanding of themselves and their lives. Often their gloomy states result in fresh insights and creative thoughts. Science has confirmed the link between geniusness and depression. Oh, let me just... Uh, so let me give you some examples. Ernest Hemingway, Jackson Pollock, Winston Churchill, you know Churchill, the famous politician, Jewish politician, Sigmund Freud, Ed Lincoln, Napoleon Bonaparte, you can name the, the, the famous singing bands, the famous artists, you just name it. If you took, if you made a country of the saddest people in the world, that would not only include all the prophets, but would include all the geniuses of the world. 
And he goes and goes, gives details who they are. <clears throat> Sadness shows us our demons. Sadness shows us our demons, meaning the things we fear. And the things that are our weaknesses. And how fragile human beings are. Khulika al-insan, ajula, or da'ifa. The dark parts of our hearts are agitations and our loathings to our cynicism and our uh, and they're an integral part of ourselves. Just as Allah created day and night, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَالتَّقْوَاهَا Man carries taqwa within him, the part to restrain yourself, and fujur also. These both are part of human beings. And you get in touch with this reality of yourself, that how dark you can be, or how enlightened you can be, or how you choose by when you are in the state of sadness. That depth allows then the best poetry to come out, like Iqbal, or the best painting to come out, so on and so forth. And this is what this uh, whole thing is about. <coughs> the pursuit of happiness at any cost has led Americans disconnected from reality. They perceive things solely in terms of monetary value. The forests, fields, mountains, and marshes have become commodities to trade and sell. Youth and beauty are things to purchase in the latest creams and things. Education is merely a means to a salary. The result is a growing, growing narcissism, which means to love yourself and just I, 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 which is what Iblis did. And there's a relationship then therefore between Iblis, I, 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 istakbara, I, and rebellion, which is Aba, or I and Iblis in grief. <coughs> Education is merely a means to a salary. The result is a growing narcissism. Americans are becoming gods of, a, of pleasure. Basically, they're, they're people who want pleasure and pleasure and pleasure and pleasure. Psychologist James Hillman's observed, depression opens a door to beauty of some kind. Basically, why? <coughs> okay, I, I can't find it here, but I'll explain it myself. When you are in state of happiness, the beauty that you accept as beauty is the same beauty that everyone accepts as beauty. Meaning it's the, it's the, it's the cultural understanding of beauty. When you hit depression or sadness and you get connected with reality, then you tend to see beauty in a different way. You don't see it from the perspective of the cultural landscape, but you tend to see beauty more from the perspective of reality, what is really beautiful. You see what I'm trying to say? And so, so sadness as it's connected to creativity helps a person become more creative and creative because a creative person is trying to look for new ways of expression. And those new ways of expression are expressed when you're in contact with reality. You tend to see beauty in a different way. And so, uh, I'm just looking for this. Uh, So uh, one of the uh, 
philosophers Alan Watts said, there's a contradiction in wanting to be perfectly secure in a universe whose nature is momentary, is momentary and fluid, fluid, fluidness. Sadness enables people to perceive true beauty and to differentiate it from what is merely pretty. This is the words he uses. Whereas beautiful things have a starkness and wilderness about them. This is the quality. They have a wilderness like the desert or the, the sea or the ocean. There's a certain quality that they have. Pretty things tend to look artificial and alike. You take ten beautiful things that are culturally accepted as beautiful, they all look alike. Let's say ten beautiful people, they look alike, right? Whereas when you hit reality, you see beauty in a different way. And they are stark, meaning they're different. Every, everything is different. Uh, and yet, it is wild and beautiful. So, I think I'll just end here because this is really what I wanted to say. And so this... Uh, discussion was really about the process of self-discovery and how we should embrace uh, our sadness and not only how we should embrace sadness but um, going through this reminded me how the people of Tazkia of the past some of the uh, mystics of the past or some of the um, scholars who, who talked about Tazkia Tignafs they would emphasize on you know, there's a reason that there's an emphasis on, uh, for example, even to the point of, for example, one of the scholars wrote that you should wear this type of atr, because it creates a certain sadness. Like the sandalwood atr creates an aura or a smell that is, creates a sense of sadness. And so, uh, whether it's aromatherapy through smells or just listening to the Qur'an in a, in a sad voice, for example, this was part of the tarbiyah that was being used at uh, a few hundred years ago, which is not used, for example, this idea of sadness is not used. And uh, even there is a group of uh, mystics uh, that uh, uh, some people have associated Alama Iqbal with that are called uh, the lawa mean the people that are always blaming themselves or being critical of themselves, so on and so forth. But sadness is a good thing for our children too, to, to see sadness in life. It is a way of connecting them to the reality rather than the video games and the cartoons and you know the constant entertainment. Giving them a taste of sadness is an important part of their mental development and for the people that want to work for the deen, uh, people that want to work for Islam, uh, it is also an essential, crucial part of their personal training to allow themselves to sink into a state of sadness because of the reality that kicks in and the creativity that kicks in thereafter. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, when you see your husband or wife sad, it's not necessary that you have to force them out of that st state of sadness. And many times people came to the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't, uh, he, he just addressed the issue for the most part. He didn't necessarily try to take them out of that sadness. He just, because he understood that the, 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 the sadness they're going through has benefits for them. And, this, and, and not only did he understand that, but in many cases he even encouraged it. Um, when you see people get becoming too happy, uh, you push them towards a state, a somber, more somber state. And when you see people losing the mercy of Allah is really the issue. If you don't have the mercy of Allah, you always tend towards happiness. right? So you have to work this way, not this way. So, but we have a society that's completely like here, uh, you know, it's, it's just on the other end of the scale. And so, um, so when you see uh, your wife is sad, your husband is sad, it's okay to let them, like Khadija very naturally <coughs> let the Prophet to be in the cave for as long as he wanted to. 
uh, this was the very natural thing to do. The people come out as long as they have hope. Uh, of course, if it's a clinical depression, that's a different issue, like I mentioned. But generally, to have spells of sadness is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's a very good thing. And uh, it produces great people. And so if we want our children to be great, they have to have a dose of sadness in their lives. It's very, very important. So, أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ولي سائر المسلمين ولي سائر المسلمين.